Thanks, John. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, great to be here, and, and thanks for the invitation again. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself last year. So this is going to be a slightly different. Um, take you away from the, the brainwashing and, and back to something slightly different. I've got some conflicts of interest in the past uh, for research and talks to SPRs and GPs. Now, we've got a bit of an image problem uh, in terms of rehabilitation. Anyone who gets into to cardiology wants to do the, the sexy thing, do the stents, do the, the toys, the drugs, all that stuff. And prevention and rehabilitation is the banger that's left in the shed. No one wants to know. So when people are kicked out of the, the sexy heart centre, like Liverpool Heart and Chest, um, there's a few of them will make it. Um, and a few do very well. But obviously, there are some people who are just blindly wandering back in, who have no <laughs> health literacy. And, and there's Dr. Stables there. Just uh, Someone's been pulled out of the water by the, the rehab or uh, ambulance people and kind of brought back in. Uh, so this, this could apply to many things. It could apply to prevention just as much as rehabilitation. And this could be, you know, uh, big business or corporate food, uh, that sort of thing. So it's, I, I like this slide. This is a sort of, to give you a flavour of, of, of what we, we kind of knew, this is 2005 and we knew back here with a randomised controlled trial done in Wales that if you give people rehabilitation with heart failure, they stay a third less and they have a third less events. So surely we should be doing that from 2005, we've got the randomised control evidence. Currently in the National Association of Cardiac Rehab, or the Audit of Cardiac Rehabilitation, we've got 6% of heart failure patients receiving rehabilitation. So I, I want to put it to you a little bit that a lot of the stuff we do in cardiology is, is putting lipstick on a pig. It, it makes us feel good because we, we are doing something. <laughs> and uh, having been down the, the road of, of training and, and stents and, and IVIS and, and all those things and, and working as a consultant in that area, I started to think, you know, we, we have been barking up the wrong tree a little bit. We've been, you know, kind of pushed and driven, as Rod said, about device companies, pharma, really limited absolute risk reduction in some cases for some of the drugs and procedures we use. And we're in a sick care consumption model um, at the moment, unfortunately. This is the National Service Framework, which was uh, uh, basically started about 25 years ago, maybe 20, Roger Boyle, and, and similar to modern day NHS long-term plan. And back then, we are saying, well, 50% or, or at least as many people as possible should be offered cardiac rehabilitation. And now we've got the long-term plan, which is saying, yeah, cardiac rehabilitation is recommended by NICE. Um, we want to prevent 150,000 heart attacks and, and strokes and dementia. And that if we get um, this population up to 85%, then we can do something significant. But that takes money. It takes willpower. It takes change. And so we have this document, and we're thankful that cardiovascular disease is in this document, because it did take a bit to include rehab as well. And what we don't want to do is for it to fall at the first hurdle through lack of funds, through lack of imagination, through lack of willpower. So in the post-coronavirus world that we're going to be subjected to soon, I would, I would put it to you that you know we may be, these may be the last competent decision makers left in the hospital. And um, we've got a sort of onward zombie army coming. And uh, I suspect that you already know this, but hospital admissions for heart failure are soaring to record levels. This was at the end of last year. And heart failure is being diagnosed more. Um, so actually, not only that, but we've got the NHS treating 5,000 diabetics a day as, as one in 10 are suffering. So we've got this problem that's sort of lunging towards us <laughs> like a very slow tsunami. I want to put it to you, and I want you to take away from this talk, that if cardiac rehab was a pill, it would be a true blockbuster. We have 48 randomised controlled trials with about 9,000 patients. And this is Rod Taylor's meta-analysis done through the Cochrane collaboration, showing back here, 2015, we had a 20% reduction in all-cause mortality, a 24% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. And when you look across 
potentially more important goals for us given what I've just talked to you about. Heart failure hospital admissions reduced by 40% with a number needed to treat of 18. This uh, in, uh, cardiac rehab costs £7,000 per quality, but NICE still approve new drugs up to £29,000 per quality. And if you compare that with an atrial fibrillation ablation that costs £7,000 per procedure for chronic AF or difficult AF, you may find that that procedure is only 50% successful or less if you look at the Bordeaux data. So I'm asking people, and have been doing, to I'm blue in the face for the past four years, to put the money where the maximum benefit is. This is work from Chris Gale's group uh, in Leeds, and they, they showed that even when you've got the patient in front of you, so this is your impact of care opportunities, what, do, what can you do that impacts greatly on someone with an acute coronary syndrome or someone coming through the front door? Clearly, getting coronary angiography is very important. But what's next? Cardiac rehabilitation, smoking cessation. All of these things matter, and they're to this side of the line. But if you combine all of this, if you, don't, if you get suboptimal overall treatment, that is also important. So these are the things we do the worst. People go home clutching their pills, <clears throat> wanting to take them, wanting to make a better uh, sort of life after the event. But do we give that to them? I would say to you that cardiac rehab is cost effective. So this is the cost of achieving one year to adding one year to a patient's life. And the document from 2013 we're involved in with BACPR showed that it saves money too. If we could even get it up to 65, not 85, we could save 30 million. This document was lost. It was a good document, but it was around the time Andrew Lansley announced the Health and Social Care Act and everything else fell into the, the void. It even makes onto a TED talk, for God's sake. <laughs> Staying alive, number one, two, three, four, five, six, cardiac rehab. Social integration, close relationship, quit and smoke, quit boozing. That, that is cardiac rehab as well, in <laughs> essence. Exercise, lean versus overweight, hypertension, all of that is cardiac rehab. <laughs> Um, so this is October 2019. The benefits continue. If you're post-valve surgery, we can show that you get a 34% lower risk of hospitalisation and a 61% lower risk of mortality at one year when you go through cardiac rehab versus not going through it. And the Cochrane Group have looked at heart failure. So I want you to focus on heart failure-related hospitalisation. 0.59 here. If we compare that to the best drug for heart failure on the market, Entresto against Enalapril, odds ratio 0.62 for heart, heart failure readmission. I'm not saying to compare, what I'm saying is that what could the synergy be between these two uh, drugs and therapies in heart failure? Shouldn't the heart failure nurses and the rehab nurses be counselling people and getting them towards these sort of drug strategies and allowing them to continue? So finally, after a lot of shouting, the heart failure uh, community have woken up to this, and this is now in the heart failure audit for 2019. The reason why there are variations in rehab will be actually taken forward, and they published this figure showing one-year mortality stratified by referral to cardiac rehab. And they've made it a key performance indicator in future cycles, which, if we've achieved anything in the past two years, I think is a, is a dramatic thing. The National Audit of Cardiac Rehabilitation has come through with some key recommendations. Uh, we, we're stuck in a paradigm of group-based <coughs> rehab, which is not great for many people. Some people don't want to come and shame themselves in a group. Um, but one thing they have said is that we want to increase the proportion of patients with heart failure, females, people who are black or minority or ethnic origin do, do not have the same uptake or referral rates for rehabilitation. And that's something that we should be focusing on. So in the first half of this talk, I've kind of told you what we need to do. It's a no-brainer. It's the British Cardiac Society fiesta crashing into spec savers. <laughs> Just a little, um, no, he's not even listening, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
have to get my digs at some way, you know. It's just... So the BHF have been listening. So they've produced this document about reimagining rehabilitation services, trying to make it a bit sexier. Um, you know, talking about achieving this 85% uptake and what we could achieve, um, we'd get 20,000 less deaths and 50,000 less admissions. And for this course, and from the point of view of a European sort of flavour, um, this is in the ESC guidance. It's a 1A recommendation across the board for heart failure and for other indications. There's sign guidance in Scotland. There's a national audit. There's multiple papers about what we should do. It's just the access to this that's the problem at the moment. The rehab staff can't work harder. We don't have enough money for it. Uh, how do we improve this on a, on a shoestring budget? If all the planes in airspace were to attempt to land, we wouldn't have enough space at airports. And the same thing goes for rehab. How do we get everyone in or make sure that everyone gets the same standardised care? There is a partial solution in the way. I don't know whether you've heard of REACH HF, but this is a home-based rehabilitation and self-care support package that increases the access. It, it can be delivered, uh, and there are beacon sites now. This is delivered at the patient's home um, with a combination of face-to-face -face and telephone contacts over 12 weeks. Um, this is de delivered by trained healthcare professionals trying to get all those aspects of rehab done. If you're interested in this, if you want to know more, uh, there's the BACPR standards and core components, which the last iteration was 2017. This is freely available on the web or via Heart uh, Journal. There's an open access publication there going through the core components. I'll give you a brief aspect of, of what is involved in rehab. So it's a combination of health, behaviour change and education, lifestyle and risk factor management, psychosocial health, medical risk, long-term strategies and audit all together. Those are the core components. And you find there's a lot of people who really need this. So your fell runner who uh, doesn't need any exercise or anything, you know, but is absolutely wrecked with the psychological impact of a, of a cardiac condition. The standards is that the, uh, are related to delivering the six core components by qualified people, prompt identification and referral of people, initial assessment of individual needs. So it has to be a, what matters to the patient, not we're going to send you to a dusty gym uh, you know, five miles down the road and you jump up and down on a bench for 20 minutes. Um, it needs to be about what the patient needs. And early provision of this is, is really important. The standard one relates to delivery of these. And it's about senior clinician responsibility something I've also been going on about. And we've managed to increase the amount of cardiologists who are taking a role in their local rehab service or the hospital rehab and trying to improve the leadership. There should be a lead practitioner for each component. It should be an MDT, like your Revask MDT. That's how it should work. And obviously, this is an aspirational document, but it's something that we should be taking forward in the future. Standard three is about getting uh, people in. If they can walk out of hospital, they can go to cardiac rehab, okay? No delay, because there are psychological aspects to the care that need to be addressed. And obviously a written care plan and a pathway should be uh, performed for these patients. Patients should be able to choose from a menu-based approach in the future. The venue should be a choice. We should be able to create them a personalized exercise program and nutrition program. And this should go on for a minimum of eight weeks. So I'll put it to you that do we need a separate UK training track for this? This is not something that often gets taught. Uh, we know how to put a stent in or to uh, you know, put a pacemaker in, but we don't really know how we should be organising these services or helping these services. So it's my you know, sort of goal that in the future we'll somehow get to a, a stage where people compare their Bugatti with their Robin Reliant and maybe do a, a cardiovascular specialty, but also have an area of leadership with regard to their pre the prevention and rehabilitation um, uh, theories or what, whatever we're going to do in that particular area for those particular patients. And this means talking to GPs. It means talking to uh, people in the management of the hospitals. It's a varied sort of uh, thing. We've uh, had to talk to the council. Um, in order to do a prevention strategy. So it's not just uh, seeing patients and banging stents in. There are modules that exist online for BACPR, and there's a hope that in the future the BHF and the BCS may consider offering future leadership courses <coughs> and a clinical champions proposal for rehabilitation and prevention. 
So I would put it to you that it shouldn't be rehabilitation, it should be a hybrid heart enhancement programme that involves um, a multidisciplinary uh, approach, ultimately towards an individual goal. Now, I know there's been a slight Game of Thrones theme here, but um, I don't know how many of you watch Game of Thrones, but my theory about this is that this could be done by a single trained person to some extent. The basic nuts and bolts of prevention and rehabilitation it doesn't need to be the cardiologist, but it needs to be someone who knows what they're doing, who has a good rapport with patients. This person is probably, no one knows who this is, but if you watch Game of Thrones, you might know. The reason for this is one year mortality is significantly lower for those having cardiology follow-up, heart failure, nurse input, cardiac rehabilitation, all those aspects. And the three core work streams for uh, BACPR going forward are related to increasing the profile of this, this is why I'm here today, supporting personal and professional development of individual BACPR members and also supporting the rehabilitation programmes to deliver best practice. Now this is Aspire 3 Prevent. It was an audit run by uh, Professor David Wood from Imperial before he moved to, to Ireland. And it was to look at cardiac rehab to see what we were achieving in there and to really sort of see what, what happened. And one of the most striking things that I want to share with you was related to diabetes and glucose metabolism, which Rod mentioned in the last talk. In Aspire 3 Present, uh, Prevent, one third, the classic one third, as Rod alluded to, walked in with self-reported diabetes with their tablets in their hands saying, I'm a diabetic. But what they did in this audit is they repeated people's HbA1c, the fasting glucose, and did an oral glucose tolerance test. And what they found was, in actual fact, those coming back with coronary artery disease diagnosis, only 28% of them were truly normal glycemic. So therefore, 72% were dysglycemic. And that has an impact in that all the diabetics in all the trials ever performed, labelled as diabetes, at that 30% level who benefit from X, Y and Z, in real time we're starting to see a shift in that more people are becoming dysglycemic and that is a major impact going forward. There are people who are taking this into their own hands who are diabetics. There are online diabetes communities showing results of digit digitally delivered programmes that people can lose weight, get their HbA1c down, get off insulin, get off medications and take control. One in four can put their type 2 diabetes into remission. And JBS3 states that if we can get this sort of reduction in HbA1c, then we could be preventing 10 to 15% of CVD events for every 10 millimole reduction in HbA1c. And I've seen some phenomenal reductions from 100 to 35, even in colleagues who didn't think they were diabetic. And the problem we're going to see coming forward, the problem we're going to have to deal with, what you're going to have to deal with as you go back into practice, <laughs> is that we've got this tsunami of metabolic syndrome, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance. You only have to look around. There's a lot of Barneys around, certainly in my clinic. And they are all going to be the ones who are pitching up with these problems going forward, as well as more people being diagnosed with this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Again, a, a multi-faceted disease process, which I would say to you, a lot of it is, the majority is preventable. So as I start to wind up, I'll point you in the direction of one of the latest BACPR endorsed uh, articles. It's just been published in Heart. It's from uh, the commissioned BACPR dietary work group that we set up uh, at the start of my presidency. and. It's a detailed document that goes through some of the myths, uh, some of the bits and pieces that people get confused with in the media, uh, and relates back to the problem with studies in this area. Um, so it's a good document that if you want to have a look at it. It's just a, but ultimately, what we want is to try and knock people off the course they're on when we see them in rehabilitation. They're probably uh, suffering with multiple issues, but a lot of it will come back to their lifestyle and their diet. And we want people to be giving up this sort of thing, low nutrient energy that the population likes to consume, and moving them towards high nutrient energy and avoiding the trifecta of high carb, high fat, and high energy density, which would make you overeat. And we're seeing people embrace this. People are wearing uh, glucose monitors, subcutaneous glucose monitors, tracking their own glucose, and then changing their diet 
and showing that they've got very, very much improved time and range. And the only hope is that in the future, we can take that forward for many patients who come back to rehabilitation. We can uh, educate them on what this actually means in terms of the long-term uh, event rate. And hopefully many people will embrace the smart sort of culture that hopefully will come in the future, that we can trace people's blood pressure, ECGs, uh, blood glucose, all the important risk factors can be managed. And that will pertain to cardiac rehab access. We may have less patient contact. There may be an ability for people to do this and be tracked remotely or virtually. So in terms of future rehabilitation considerations, I'm putting rehabilitation in inverted commas because I don't really like the word. It makes me think of the Betty Ford Clinic and I've been a naughty boy and I need to go and get my hands slapped somewhere and, and be told what I should and shouldn't be doing. I don't think patients respond well to that. We've got an ageing population living with chronic multimorbidity. We know that comprehensive programmes that manage six or more risk factors can reduce total mortality. We need a personalised programme taking responsibility for all the medication, lifestyle aspects, psychological aspects. And this is the um, publication here. We need hybrid approaches, not just exercise. So in conclusion, cardiac rehab programmes are the blockbuster pills we're not prescribing supporting or advocating, I would ask you to go away and do that. The, then the sticking point is the patients who often are their own worst enemies, programmed to self-destruct. We need to do this better and for more people, especially those with heart failure. We need to look into hybrid home and community-based recovery plans. We could make it the job of a single specialist hybrid healthcare professional, someone with an exercise background or a physician associate, or these are things we're looking into in Liverpool at the moment, someone who has knowledge who can be um, brought forward to uh, be able to uh, take forward behaviour change in this population. So in the future, I hope that all existing heart failure nurses could be upskilled to help de deliver the home-based and digital rehabilitation. There'll be more hands to the wheel, because we certainly need that. But we do need future cardiologists like yourself to help lead this. So the future challenges lie with you. We need leadership and image, we need uptake, we need flexible individualised programmes that focus on metabolic disease as well, and we need accreditation and quality. We can upscale the prevention, the prehabilitation, and we need commissioning, funding and a voice, and we, we can do better, so I hope that we can train an army of heart disease killers. Um, so thanks very much for your, for your attendance. If you, Want to join BACPR? We only have 16 doctors. It only costs £40. Um, there are lots of important uh, training and, and uh, educational stuff online that we can uh, open up for you. And there is an annual conference, which next year is in Belfast. It's cheaper than most conferences. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions before the next uh, talk. Any questions here at all? Yeah. Do you is the heart manual for a hopeless rehab programme? Because uh, we were using that 20 years ago and it was very successful, particularly for people in fairly remote rural locations. Yeah, so the heart manual is still going strong. Uh, it, it's, used, it's used in pockets around the UK. There are some people who are big advocates of it. It is very, very useful, essentially, if, if, and should be offered to patients if they're not someone who wants to come to a class. Or um, so it is really, really, and Reach HF is kind of a bit like the the heart manual, but slightly toned down for your heart failure or your breathless patient. Um, but you know, all the important aspects of rehabilitation are in there. I think we just m might need to move forward with the times because we're we are seeing more patients who are multi-morbid, obese you know, diabetic, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's multiple wheels in motion now. It's not just your standard patient who's got, you know, a stent after a, a bit of chest pain. There's a whole other set of baggage comes along and that's not going to be dealt with by, sometimes by just the heart manual. Any questions? Why is it so hard to get funding? Yes, well, it's, it's just not sexy enough, is it? <laughs> no, it's, 
I'll give you an idea of the funding that's coming through for the long-term plan. So what I've been told is that there'll be £40 million pounds over eight years for cardiac rehabilitation to try and get us from 50% uptake to 85%, you know, almost doubling. Now, when you look at more than 200 programmes in the UK and start to divvy that down, yes, there's going to be some money there, but not enough to be radically game-changing. So. The, the issue is that it's, it's always been seen as a Cinderella service. You know, it will be funded from the back of the sofa in many hospitals. They'll be getting the money for the people, you know, out of sort of coffers or stuff that's sort of lying around. But it is actually, there is a payment associated with rehabilitation that is bundled up in all of the tariff for, you know, a stent and, you know, an admission and an ICD or a, a bypass. So the money is there. But the money is about £450 per patient. But to deliver what we kind of need, we, we need more money. We haven't had the investment that PPCI had, or there's no device or pharmaceutical company who, who really want this to happen because it Im improves things in the long term. So can I, can I be provocative and extend that? And just onto what you're saying. So when you look at the rehab studies, they're all observational, right? Yeah. So the people who don't do rehab do worse. But there could be a lot of reasons why people don't come to rehab that are nothing to do with the rehab itself. Yeah. Do you think there is a role for a good, old-fashioned, randomized trial? You could say, let's randomize a patient to give them 450 pounds and do what they want to do, or come to rehabilitation. And, and that might drive, I mean this seriously, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I, I can I, tell you what would happen in Liverpool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have a lot of patients coming in pretty knocked out. Um, <laughs> alcohol is cheap. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's a valid point, and I think the problem is there is a healthy user bias to rehab. Even though there's randomised controlled trials there, you can show at the end, oh, all these people went to rehab, did really well, and the other ones did really badly because they were healthy users. They attended, they did what we were told. You know, it's the same, it's the same thing. The problem is accessing that end of the spectrum of society who you can't see the benefit in this, they, you know, think it's a load of rubbish, just want to go back and go home and smoke and, you know, get the pizzas on. Uh, you know, that, that is a problem that we will n potentially never ascend from. Because no matter you know what you do for these patients, there is a subsect um, of, of, of you know the population who will never change. And I think that if you could take them out of the equation and then maybe look at the people who are in the middle ground who you know would be willing to come along, I think it's the offer that's the problem at the moment. You know, to go to a church hall in the back of nowhere on a 72 bus and then to go in and sit with some you know people who appear maybe a bit crumbly for you. Uh, it's just not a very good offer, uh, and I think that's where we've struggled, and it hasn't really moved on because it's had no investment or no new ideas. An opportunity. Thanks. Yeah. Again, Scott, okay. Take care. Uh, Bye. Wonderful session.